Hi everybody and welcome to another grumpy old men and welcome to Steve Ross. And we're not only in your home, we've come to visit the Boontongs Bar. Mm. Tell us about Boontongs. Boontongs Beach Bar, you can find it on Google Maps. Check in, Strangely. Boontongs Beach Bar. Boontongs Beach Bar was a fictional bar invented by an author named James Eckhart in the 1970s. He was writing uh, humorous anecdotes for the Bangkok Post back when newspapers mattered. And uh, he became quite famous in this country for writing about uh, his wife, Mem, and their children living uh, on the beach in Songkla. He was working uh, for the uh, uh, embassy, repatriating boat people. Okay, I'll make this brief. I can hear your thoughts right now. Anyway, he invented a bar in his books where things took place. I like James's writing a lot. I like James as a human being. So as an homage to him, I wanted to create a beach bar to set my stories in, my videos. So I called it Boontongs as a, as a tip of the hat to James Eckhart. And, and people are gonna be it. disappointed if they come here and expect a, a drink as such. Although you probably give them a drink. Well, I'd make them coffee. I don't, I don't drink alcohol, so I don't keep alcohol so in the house. We've also got some of the characters yes. uh, that you use. In the, would you like to introduce us to them? Well, uh, I don't have real actors. Uh, God does not create people in one-tenth scale, and I cannot afford to build real studio and, and, and hire real actors. But this place, Thailand, if you haven't noticed, is full of cheap action figures, 20 baht. Sometimes you can get them for 10 baht. Little plastic mannequins that are articulated, and I won't touch them because they'll fall over. They're articulated in many joints, and they can pose, and they can assume uh, uh, attitudes. I like the fact that uh, the, the fan we've got to keep us cool uh -huh. is uh, actually yeah. helping Superman's coat wave. And I, his cape. I do that. Superman and Batman both have capes. And they play characters. They play the expats. They play the phalang. The farang in this bar are uh, played by these little action figures. I also have a go-go, I have a short-time hotel, and I have an old a house in Isan, a very poor uh, house on a, on a wasted rice farm in Isan. And I set my stories in one of these four places each week. Uh, and uh, these guys play the roles of the expatriates in the bar, the tourists in the bar, and these are uh, the, the young women who work in the bar. And uh, what about this one? That's for you, Tim. That's, that's a blow-in. That's to welcome Tim uh, to my house. I've got a much bigger version of that in yeah. my pool. Yeah. So now let's have a quick talk about Thai immigration because during the week, yeah. Thai immigration have been making their way into the headlines for all the wrong reasons. And, Nothing uh, new there. Nothing there's new. been uh, words like extortion. Mm. Uh, kidnapping and if people were thinking oh, maybe I'd like to go and live in Thailand I, I could move up to Tan Mung and live like Steve and play with dolls and live the great life over the road from the beach oh but hang on maybe I'm going to be kidnapped well God willing no and they're action figures they're not dolls uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, these words, uh, how those particular immigration officers would translate extortion and kidnapping well, into Thai. They uh, did extort uh, uh, well, yeah, by Chinese our, businessmen, and uh, they did kidnap him Yeah, well. oh, they gave him a ride for five hours around, where was it, Tonglor or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, in, in our value system, this is kidnapping. In their value system, it's making a living. And we don't know the backstory. We don't know what interactions went on. I'm not defending. I think you are. Extra, no, no, no. I'm just saying I'm not surprised uh, that immigration in Bangkok acts this way. It was Bangkok, right? It was Bangkok, yeah, yes, yes. That yes. immigration acts this way, that officialdom in this kingdom uh, acts this way, that they get money from other than their salary, that they throw their weight around, they, they exercise their authority in ways that are not dictated by their job description. You haven't been... This does not su surprise me at all. You haven't been kidnapped? Uh, no, uh, I could talk about my ex-wife and the way she took over my life and held me prisoner for a while, but no... Uh, the worst I worry about is, uh, is, you know, a long queue or being yeah. stuck in a line without uh, you know, air conditioning or something. Can I, oh, can I tell you an immigration story? Sure, please. From back in the 80s, and everybody listening... I'm going to put a timer on this. Can but. Compare, yeah. Everybody listening can compare their current experiences to Steve's experience in the 80s. So I had a work permit. I had a business visa in the 80s, and I lived on Phuket for seven years. I was married. I had children. And at one point uh, early on, I was taking my wife with me to my annual check-ins. 
and they were uh, marriage. I don't remember. It wasn't a marriage visa. I don't think such existed then. But uh, uh, we would take in uh, utility bills with both our names on it, photographs of kids' birthday parties, that kind of thing, and appear together. We would be separated, and the immigration officer would ask us questions separately. Where did you meet your wife? What work was she doing when you met her? Have you met her family? Yeah, well, my wife was the, was the daughter of a Palarampu, of a Karachikan, of a higher caliber than the guy asking the questions. As soon as my wife let him know who her father was, all the questions dried up and we got to go. Oh. But on one occasion, we met a, a new uh, immigration officer who didn't know us, and he was giving us a hard time, and he was obviously looking for money. So my ex said, uh, how much do you want? And he kind of let slip, oh, you know, X, X thousands bought. She said, all right, we're going to go to the did, ATM. Does the door, did the drawer under the table just sort of magically open up? How, Not how that was I it saw. done? No, 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 they were speaking in Thai. There were just okay. three of us in the room. Negotiating the fee. And, and he assumed I did not speak Thai, and they were, they were conversing in Southern Thai, like Thai. And uh, he said, X amount of bot. She said, OK, we're going to go to the ATM. We'll be right back. We didn't go to the ATM. We went to the office machinery store. She bought a brand new IBM Selectric typewriter, because in those days, the immigration officers were still using the old clackety-clack typewriters. She then took it to the trophy store and had in gold gilt paint written on the front of it, this machine is a gift from the Falang Steve Ross. And we took that, and in front of everybody in the office, we presented that to the officer, the offending officer, who was absolutely furious but could not show his fury, of course. And they put that out in the office, and every time I went for the next six, seven years, <laughs> there was my name in immigration on the front of this beautiful, it stood out in the office. There was no equipment like it in the office, an IBM self-correcting uh, uh, typewriter. And uh, she got around giving this guy to Bakshish. And he actually admired her for that, because that's a very Thai, moo moo, blah, blah, kind of, ooh, I'm sorry, moo moo, blah, blah, uh, snake, snake, fish, fish, a way to go about things. And he said, yeah, OK, tip of the hat to you, lady. And uh, we were always welcome there after that. It was in and out, easy okay. peasy. All right. A good story. But I, I suppose the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you go to immigration, you don't always get kidnapped. And Not I, always. I just wanted to make that clear. Maybe fifty percent, at most, fifty yeah, percent of the time. Because it's not uh, all that bad, and most people, and people went out of their way to send me good stories about Thai immigration. Yeah. A lot of the times, they do look after you very well. And honestly, I think they are less likely to be. <laughs> I'll use that to shut you up when. All right. Uh, yeah, it won't work. Uh, you can try it. Go ahead. Try it. Doesn't mean I. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think that immigration is more ham-fisted and heavy-handed with Asian nationalities, because I think uh, Asians will roll over for it. They know they hassle a white face, and this guy's going to raise bloody hell. He's going to, you, you're going to kidnap me for five hours. I'm going to go to the embassy. I'm going to go to the newspapers, or I'm going to go online, and I'm going to let the world know what you've done, and I'm going to say your names. I'm going to point you out. I don't care about face. I don't care about who Sienna. I don't it care. It mightn't be good pointing that out to them, given that they might try to prevent you from doing so in the form of, we, well, uh, I, yeah, I don't know how willing uh, any Karachikan is to back up threats with force. Any I'm what? Sure Karachikan, a government official, a guy okay. in, a, okay. in, a, in a sickly green uniform. Right. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I suppose that's up to the individual. I think there are probably some officers who would pistol whip you without any warning just because they were having a bad day. You know, kicking dogs. It's an old book by Colin Pipperell. Uh, there is an expression, uh, what is it, tama? that uh, if you're angry, if I'm angry at you, I'm never going to express that to you publicly, but I'll go home and kick my dog. And, oh, okay. and you know, you... So, uh, yeah, there might be someone who... who so... Just the threat of it, like a dog with a spritz bottle, right? Just the threat. <laughs> uh, my, my mother would uh, rattle the, the drawer with the wooden spoon. <laughs> just rattle the drawer, yeah. that's all it took. Corporal punishment. I was uh, gone. Uh -huh. uh, now, another thing that a lot of people say in our comment section, and uh, thank you to all those people that have uh, written kind comments, and Steve thanks the ones that have written the nasty comments. Oh, he loves. Bless you guys. Love the trolls. Bless the trolls. Bless the trolls. You but guys what, are one my thing brothers. people refer to, and it's a bit of an old term that you don't hear 
much these days, but they refer to Thailand when they want to sort of be derogatory about the place. They're always sort of saying things like, that's a, it's a third world country, it's some sort of put down. Firstly, what do you think is a third world country? And then is Thailand a, a third world country? Well, yeah, I don't like that term because it's, it's, it no longer means what it was coined to mean. It's a holdover from the Cold War. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, back in the 50s, a French, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a French political scientist coined that term. He wrote a book called uh, One Planet, Three Worlds. First world was the Western capitalist nations. Second world was the Soviet communist nations. Third world were the non-aligned countries, the little pipsqueak countries that Russia and America weren't fighting over yet. So third world was a political, geopolitical term. It had nothing to do with economics or culture. Now that's all moot. There's no Cold War. Nobody's aligned with anybody anymore. Everybody's out there getting their own. And so I don't know what that term means. I suppose to a lot of, uh, particularly expats, perhaps particularly expat males, it means uh, a, a poor country that doesn't have my advantages of education and understanding of the world at large, and it does things in ways or even more simply, I don't approve of. Even more simply, it's not as good as where I come from. Yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's the, what they're yeah. trying to say. You're third world. I'm first world. Wherever I'm from, whether it's, Soviet, whether it's Russia or America or, or Australia or the UK, where I come from is the first world. You're third tier. You're third drawer. I certainly don't see, living here, and, and I've been here for 12 years, I don't see Thailand as backwards in as many things that people think. No. I mean, things like internet speeds. My uh, God, it's so fast. Oh, yeah. And it's relatively cheap compared yeah. to a, a probable first world country like Australia. Well, certainly it's much faster. The ties are into gaming and always have been. So if you want to sell uh, uh, internet connectivity to ties, it's got to be top of the line. It's got to be fast as hell because they're gaming constantly. They're on their phones all day long, burning sure. data. And where I came from, I came uh, 10 months ago now from uh, this trip. I came 10 months ago from New Mexico. And we were out in the desert in New Mexico. And it was like two bars, if you got any bars at all, on your phone. And the internet uh, uh, upload and download was like 0.4 or something. It was terrible where I was. And I was dial up speed. Yeah, it still made that sound. It didn't actually, but it was. Sorry, like that. could you just do that again? You remember sitting and waiting for porn to come across one line at a time? Anybody remember that? Anyway, uh, you had to be really desperate. This is playing chess. Yeah, sure, chess. Yeah, right. each move each took an porn. hour and a half. Yeah, but at any rate, yeah, I think uh, there is nothing backward about this country. There is a lot of poverty. There's a lot of uh, disadvantaged people. And a lot of wealth. Yeah, it is like uh, America is becoming perhaps the rest of the world. The, there's no longer a, a solid middle class or an expanding middle class. Yeah. The middle class is shrinking, and all those people are not moving up. They're all going down into the, into the uh, less advantaged class. I see a lot of that, but uh, the roads here, you know, you cannot, if you're Karachikan, you cannot steal money out of a budget unless there's a budget. You need a project. You need an infrastructure project. So the roads here in Tai Mulung are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, driving up here as I do mm -hmm. once a week, uh, the roads are very, very good. Yeah. Now, if you drive around most of Thailand, I think you're going to be surprised by the quality of the roads. Mm -hmm. Around Bangkok, there's the odd pothole. They do their roads a lot better than they do their pavements. Yes. But generally, the, yeah. the roads, I believe, are of very good quality. Yes, they are, because infrastructure, roads and bridges uh, here where we are, fishing piers, uh, they're all well constructed and, 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 and maintained well, because that's you have to have a budget to do that. And once you have a budget, you can take a few pennies out of the, the concrete section and a few pennies out of the painting section, a few pennies, and that's how Karachikan make a living. <clears throat> so they, they, as far as a being a third world or disadvantaged country, uh, it, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make my point. Uh, no, I don't think this place uh, would qualify under any conceivable definition of third world. Let's have a talk about your, uh, your Russian friends. Are they, these are your Russian friends who are with the Katoy next door? 
No, he, he was German. He was Austrian. That, Austrian. That I, young man, that wonderful, oh, brilliant, naive Europe. young man, uh, I, I, who, you know, I encouraged him when he goes back to Austria to find a Buddhist temple, a Thai Buddhist temple, and go there on Wan Prat and meet the Thai people and learn some Thai and learn about Thailand. And because, uh, you know, he's one of these people who comes on holiday once a year for a month, six weeks. He has no contact with Thailand in between. So he's not learning anything about Thailand. And he's an absolute newbie every single time he comes. And he's taken advantage of and, and robbed, literally. And, and so I said, you know, and he said, oh, I don't think there. Oh, no, I've never seen any Thai people. I live in a very small rural town up in the mountains in Austria. He goes on his phone. There's two Thai temples in his little country town. There's two. There's enough Thai people living there to support two Buddhist temples, and he was just amazed. Here was a resource that had never occurred to him to exploit, and and I'm hoping he'll learn something. But the Russians, there are five, five, five young Russian draft dodgers in uh, Turtle Beach. Do you uh, know the that moment. they're draft dodgers? They're of draftable age. They are young single men traveling alone in a pack the five of them. Okay. Uh, no wives, no children, uh, no parents. And they have nothing really to do. They don't go visit the temples. They don't travel around the country. They have just put down their stakes in the very cheapest bungalow complex on Turtle Beach. And they're living like three to a room. Which is pretty cheap compared to other parts oh, yeah. of Thailand. Oh, anyway. it's dirt cheap. It's dirt cheap in Thailand. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Well, one reason I'm here. I can afford on my Social Security to live here like a king. We won't let you come to Phuket. No, I don't. I, Far I too sophisticated I, for you. It, that's right. Yes, I'm a, I'm a country bumpkin, and uh, I can't handle Phuket, so it's best I stay the way, stay the heck out of that dump. So a lot of people, once again in the comments section, they tend <laughs> to use the... Uh, they tend to use the word draft dodger as a, yeah. some sort of derogatory term. But I, I would have to say that... Um, I would probably be doing my best to avoid being mm. put into the front line of a war that I didn't agree with. Uh, I, yeah, I graduated from high school in 1975. The war in Vietnam ended in 73. But this was a conversation my mother and I had. And she said, if they try to draft you, I'll buy you a bus ticket to Canada. And I said, thank you. I will accept that bus ticket to Canada. I wasn't going to go to Vietnam. Are you nuts? You I ended up uh, working for the Army. Yeah, uh, I worked uh, the last eight years of my working life at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, for the U.S. Army. Fort that, Bliss, yeah, really? Fort Bliss, yeah, a, a misnomer if there ever was one. The uh, photos I saw, it, there was not a lot blissful. Of it. it looked like uh, uh, it's the armpit of the universe. Yeah, uh, armpits, yes. Yeah, El Paso. Uh, it's and particularly for me. I mean, I, I don't want to talk politics, but I did not fit in in El Paso, Texas. Uh, and I was the only Hillary voter in a nine-story building. And everybody... Funny, funny during the week, just to digress, that uh, during the week, all the memes, as um, Mr. The, the former president, Donald Trump, predicts his own arrest, the memes have been Hillary holding up a sign, lock him up. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, you know, what comes, goes around comes around. Karma's a bitch, baby. Uh, Especially in Thailand. Yeah, and so I did not fit in there, but I learned a lot. And I very much respect the ethic of service and self-sacrifice and patriotism. The men and women I worked with at the William Bowman Army Medical Center at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, were the salt of the earth. The, I sit in the break room with these guys at a baby shower, sit in the break room at lunch. They are wonderful, sweet people. But every morning they had to come loom over my desk and tell me what uh, Rush Limbaugh told them on the radio in the car on their way to work to tell a liberal. And I was the only liberal there. So they would come loom over my desk and tell me where I got it wrong. And then <clears throat> once they, you know, they did their 10 minute spiel or five minute spiel, then we were friends and colleagues and compatriots. But I very much, I say, you know, before that I worked six years at the Veterans Administration. I probably in the last, what's eight and six, 14, the last 14 years of my working life, I probably said, thank you for your service 50 times a day. And I meant it. I was absolutely sincere. Uh, I also say it to teachers, by the way, school teachers. Thank you for your service. If there are any school teachers out there, or any veterans, thank you sincerely for your service. <clears throat> but I 
uh, as much as I had a fantasy as a child reading Sergeant Rock comic books, and I enjoy random violence on the movie screen as much as anybody, as much as any male. Uh, Team I, America! Ah, yeah, F yeah. Uh, I would not have fought in Vietnam. I would not have fought in Iraq. I would not have fought in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I think an immoral war is an immoral war, and it's a crime. And you participate, you abet in that, and you're going to regret it. And I certainly heard a lot of soldiers at Fort Bliss who were combat veterans or even just, you know, uh, second echelon force veterans, uh, ruining their participation in that war. They were very happy to be career soldiers. They were very happy to sacrifice and serve their nation. Uh, but they were bitter and, and angry about having to go and participate in, in those two crimes. So yeah, I get these Russian guys uh, running away from that. I would run like hell. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been told they're just grabbing young men off the street at this point. In, in Russia? In Russia. Yeah, you go out for a pack of smokes and the cops grab you and drag you to the army. They slap a uniform on you. Have you spoken to any of these uh, young Russians around here about these issues? No, no, no. I've talked to them about marijuana. They're huge marijuana consumers, but they don't buy it locally from my friend's store. Uh, by the way, so. Mr. YouTube, as you're reviewing oh. this, we are not glorifying no. any particular herbs no, by all in means. any way. Yeah, stay away. We stay keep away. getting demonetized. Uh, you, you end 50 years of, of uh, consuming uh, broccoli every yes. day. You end up like this. Uh, it, when I was uh, going through school, my secondary school in Australia, I was petrified about being drafted and being sent off to mm. Vietnam, a thing that we'd be seeing on the news every night. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was something that used to bother me. Thankfully, yeah. whilst I was at school, we had a government that came in and uh, stopped conscription. Yep. But uh, yeah, I, I don't blame yeah. these young Russian people no, or but, the families from saying, no, 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 this is not my war. I will be go to Thailand. They'll yep. allow me to come and stay here for 45 days just to avoid this. And uh, in those 45 days, I will apply for asylum or citizenship in New Zealand or Australia or the United States. Now, they can't takes, do that here in Thailand. They can't apply for They asylum. have to go and apply and come back? Or? Well, they can't. There's no asylum in, uh, in oh. Thailand. Well, whatever. They're, they're applying to become... They're not going home, is my point. They're yeah, never going right. back to Mother yeah. Russia. They can go to They've, the Maldives for 90 yeah. days. They'll allow yeah. them to stay there. They go to the Philippines for a while. And the goal is to get someplace stable and become a citizen, uh, as my grandparents did. I, have a, I had a Russian grandfather. Uh, and, uh, you know, their, their hope is to get away. And uh, these five young men, I've not talked to them about that. I don't begrudge them running uh, uh, from an illegal, uh, uh, immoral war, but you still got to wear a shirt when you go into 7-Eleven, kid. You, you still got to follow the rules here, man. You, you, you know, you can't park wherever you want. You can't park in front of a place that sells the sunset and people are lined up there to watch the sun go down, and you come and park your car in front of these people between them and the sunset. Is you, that them being smart asses, or are they just ignorant about that? I think they're ignorant. I think they've never been outside their own country. Yeah, sure. They don't know how to behave as a guest in someone else's home. Man, you don't wear, you don't go shirtless into a business. That's treating his business like it's your own home. That's I, I walked in here today into this house shirtless, and Steve said, put a shirt yeah. on. Yeah, Just exactly. The way it is. Well, that he has a very ugly body. That's you know. That's, that's what true. that is. That you know? is true. Uh, but no, him. you know, you've got to be. And you know this yellow card, red card thing that they've launched in Phuket. Warning. I don't know. I mean, it's only in Phuket. Am I right? At the moment, it's it's a bit of a fishy story, and they gave a bit more of the story out this week, saying that a Finnish man and then a Russian, a Ukrainian was deported over this red card thing. You get a yellow card for sort of level three mm -hmm. offences and you get a red card. For you know, anything we want. If you get a red card, it's a major offence and you're sort of um, escorted to the airport and apparently sent back home. Yeah. If you're Russian, you probably don't want that at the moment. No. So uh, yeah, it's a bit of a funny system where this is this arbitrary yellow red yeah. card thing with no redress to a court or a or no, a lawyer. And I think it's a, it's something that was brought about because the conversation for since since COVID restrictions were lifted uh, has been, what are we going to do with all these crazy Russians? You know what they're. they're they're acting this way, they're acting crazy, and there's millions of them getting off the plane. What are we going to do? Well, let's, inst and it's only in Phuket, 
which I guess Phuket and Pattaya are the two epicenters of, of uh, current Russian immigration. And again, I had a Russian grandfather. I got nothing against the Russian people. I love you, I love everybody. Uh, but groups of these young men are not behaving well. And probably everybody watching this who lives on Phuket or lives in Pattaya has a crazy Russian story, right? And, and so a response from some Karachikan has been the yellow card, red card scheme, which they've never needed before. There have been crazy Falang making trouble on Phuket forever, right? Yes, 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 that's forever. Right. That's and they didn't need yellow cards and red cards. They just, you know, they, they had just a system the in place. the latest trendy yeah. people behaving badly. Yeah, there was a, there was a, a, a French uh, uh, photographer back in 83. Oh, all right. Didn't even start the story. So, uh, yeah, we've sort of run out of time. The battery's oh. about to run down. Right. I've got to plug in the rubber duck. Oh, Strange this story. place where you plug it in, by the way. <laughs> anyway, you're going to tell I'm the story anyway. I'm not here to judge. I'm not here oh, to God, judge. No, I'm not. No, we'll save it for next time. We'll save it for so next time. So we did learn the word Karachikan today. Yeah. My, Kar my ex-father-in-law ex was Karachikan. Kar yeah. Which means... A man, a man in a putty-colored uniform that... Uh, will do a favor for you for a couple thousand baht under the table. Yeah. Okay, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for being grumpy. Uh, thank you, Steve Ross. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week with more grumpiness yeah. on well, TNT. I By the way, subscribe to the channel. There's a link to Steve's channel underneath where you can see more of this going on and uh, more of these. Is it you with a, your hand up there, dresses and things? Is it that you? Well, not on camera, certainly. Okay. That happens, you know, in the casting calls. That's You'll have how to they see. get the role. That's There's a, a the link part. in the, the description yeah. anyway. Uh, but I'm, I'm back with TNT on Monday with the usual news program. Thank you for watching. Thank you.